on today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast. Apparently, there's a new synopsis for Blade out there, and it's going to kind of focus on the hunt for Blade's daughter. Also, Deadpool 3, Kevin Feige showed up at the Saturn Awards with a new Deadpool and Wolverine logo. We're going to talk about that, see if it actually tells us anything. Paul Bettany confirms that Vision will return to the MCU. Speaking of returning to the MCU, Jeremy Renner is saying he's ready to go whenever they're ready to call on him to come back. Blue Beetle... The star of the movie has just confirmed that, yeah, what we've been talking about, he is going to be the Blue Beetle in the new DCU, and I kind of think this might be James Gunn's first big mistake. Also, Henry Cavill's Argyle movie absolutely flopped. We're going to talk about why that and a whole bunch more. The John Cabot Show podcast starts right now. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, the John Campus Show podcast. Come to you from right here in our quaint little studio, brought to you in part by our friends <laughs> at Mint Mobile. I am, of course, your host, John Campion, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around to talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movie news, TV and streaming, and all sorts of good stuff, not just giving you our opinions, but giving you some information and context so you guys can form your own well-informed opinions, whether the same or even different than ours. Uh, joining me in studio today, we got Ray Ora. Good morning. We got Jonathan Voico. Hello. Writer, director, producer, Robert Meyer Burnett. How about Picard season three at the Saturn Awards yesterday? <laughs> and of course, you've got a couple of Saturn Awards, don't you? Most importantly... You guys are here. Thank you so much for being here and making the show part of your day. And here's how today's show is going to go. We're going to break it into two parts. The first part of the show, we're going to talk about those predetermined topics I listed off. Then in the second part of the show, we're going to take your live comments and questions. Now, we already asked in our community tab, our beloved YouTube channel members, to send in some questions. But if you guys are watching live, and you've got to be watching live, go ahead and use the Super Chat feature in the live chat if you guys have a topic or question you would like us to address. As long as it's appropriate for the show, We'll address it here on the show. All right. <laughs> With that down, guys, let's jump into it, shall we? It's been... It's been... <laughs> four years since you announced Blade. Four and, and a half. Yeah, uh, four and a half years since they announced Blade. We're still kind of waiting on stuff to come around. But apparently, we are now hearing what the movie may be about. Now, of course, there's been some... Dancing and hopping and all that kind of stuff. Apparently there was a story, then they hated it, they got rid of it, started again, then they brought in new writers, and they're going again. Mahershala Ali wasn't happy for a while, now he's saying he's happy. Because you got to keep a two-time. Two-time! Academy Award winning actor <laughs> Mahershala Ali happy. Yeah. Damn right you do. And now, according to some reports at any rate, we're getting what this movie might be about. This comes to us from Joe Blow, where it's following. Now the project seems to be rolling towards production again, and industry scooper Daniel Richmond has revealed some details. According to his Patreon report, Blade is an R-rated period piece, which goes against what Kevin Feige said a couple years ago. Remember, he said that Blade wouldn't be rated R. He said only Deadpool would be rated R. They seem to have softened their stance on that. Blade is an R-rated period piece that will tell the story of Lilith, the big villain of the movie. That's who a lot of people are speculating Mia Goth is going to play. That Lilith going after Blade's daughter's blood to create an army of daywalkers. Lilith's weapon will apparently be the Ebony Blade, which was previously, of course, featured at the end of The Eternals. All right. So there were some reports that were going around earlier that a previous draft of the film really had Lilith or, or Blade's daughter as the main character in the film. At least that's what they said. And they decided to go back and redo things. I, I know there are going to be some very, very, very insecure girly boys out there who are going to be upset hearing that Blade's daughter. Uh, guys, calm down. Many, 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 many movies. If you just read a quip synopsis, you know, if you, you read the synopsis of Die Hard, it could be John McClane's wife is at her, you know, business Christmas dinner when terrorists come and take over. John's got to rescue her. Say, the movie's about John McClane's wife. No, it's, it's about John McClane. Don't, don't worry. I have a feeling this will be very much about Blade and him trying to keep his daughter safe and, and all that kind of stuff. So we'll see where that goes. Look, it also needs to be pointed out, the MCU did not put this out. So this may or may not be accurate. It might be old information. It might be for a previous draft. 
Now, the idea of going after, say, Blade's daughter, I saw somebody online write this, and it, and it's, it raises a good point, saying, why wouldn't she just go after Blade if she wants Daywalker blood? Well, if I had the choice of going after Blade or his kid, I am personally going after his kid. And then it's going to be up to Blade, of course, to, to protect her, take down Lilith, all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, this is fine. I, I, I got to tell you, Rob, the only thing I don't like that I'm hearing here, period piece. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't want a period piece. Now, granted, I say that having not read the script, maybe this movie will be perfection. It'll become my favorite movie of all time. I'm just saying... Before seeing the movie, I'm a little. I don't like hearing period piece. I want to hear that. I want to hear that this takes place after that post credit scene in Eternals. You know, I, I want to hear this happening in the current MCU. And how far back are they going to go? What is period piece? Is it the 1500s? Is it the? Is it the? You know, you know, 50 BC? Is it 1975? I mean, I just have no it's idea. 2005, man, that's a period piece. 2005 is a period piece now. Look, at, other than that, this sounds perfectly fine. Rob, what did you think of it? Uh, you know, I, I I think that initially I'm like, oh, okay, but the question that immediately popped into my head was, how could the Daywalker have a child with another Daywalker? Because that means that if you have a child with somebody, if they're fully human – the daughter would have less Daywalker blood in her. Like, I don't understand how Blade can have a daughter that's a Daywalker. I don't understand that. And I guess it's because <laughs> well, I don't know, you know. I don't know in any vampire mythology where vampires can procreate. So immediately I know he's half human. Have you not watched Twilight? Rob, I, get I am it. very disappointed. In I you. get it, but they Twilight are, makes it they, very clear. They're not real. They are they are vampires that can go in the sun. Right. So it's it's so, so for day me, walkers. For me that that while while it'd be like, you know what, John, this makes it sound like it makes it sound like what if you had like a Star Wars show about Obi Wan Kenobi and somebody said, Well, Obi Wan Kenobi's gonna go after little Princess Leia to rescue her. Oh right. They did that. You don't think Blade goes to Pound Town? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's not that it's just but it, there are it, many even in real life there are many genetic traits that if one parent has it and the other doesn't the kid still gets it uh, uh, of, right of so course. that's not a, that's of not course a but i'm just saying like it brings up a question about vampire mythology <laughs> okay. and i think i think that in the in the and this is what i've been saying f from the very beginning we need to establish we've now seen werewolf by night we've seen agatha harkness and we're getting the 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 dark old diaries um we need to establish how the supernatural works in the MCU. And maybe this movie's gonna go a long way toward doing that. And I don't mean to be flippant, but I, for, in all honesty, if this is a period piece, that means vampirism and daywalkers have been around for a long time. So again, I would ask, were they a part of the Thanos snap? If you're, an, if you're someone who's already dead, which is what a vampire really is, they're the undead and they come back to life, would they have been affected? I don't but know Thanos snap. I mean, because he had the soul stone. If they don't have a soul, then maybe not. Well, that's a question, and I think that it'd be for, fun if they brought that up. It doesn't have to be in the synopsis, but it'd be fun if they brought well, that no, up. Well, no, I think that they have to because one of the things that I've always been bitching and moaning and complaining about with Phase Four and Phase Five with the MCU is they keep extending all of this stuff that just makes us ask more questions. And for this, like they did set up Blade, and they set up the the Blade at the end of Eternals that also ties into symbiotes. Obviously, that's the Sony verse, but I, I really wish that they'd been doing a little bit more to weave in the idea of the supernatural. And you know what? Maybe I'm sensitive for this because over the weekend I read, I got the omnibus acts, uh, um, uh, judgment day, which is the Avengers X-Men and Eternals huge mini series. And I'm really loving it. And, um, uh, Druig, who's commanding the Eternals decides the X-Men have to die because in the Hickman era, the Eternals are going after true deviance. You know, if true deviancy happens, and the mutants have proven that when they defeat death that they're too far along the deviant line, so they have to be destroyed. That's what the Eternals are supposed to do. And I was reading this going, what do the, what do the deviants think? If the deviants are the source of the X gene and the source of all this stuff, what do they think of the supernatural? So do the Eternals cover like if the eternals have been on earth in the mcu for as long as they have this is a very deep rabbit hole <laughs> i know i'm sorry but do they how do they deal with the supernatural and and again if the mcu and we saw this blade introduced in the eternals do the eternals have any oversight over supernatural stuff
Well, I mean, the movie hasn't happened to give us any of these answers I yet, know. though, right? And and, and I want to point this out too. To your point about, you know, about him having a daughter, that this brings into question vampire mythology. I would say the character Blade himself is a big contradiction to classic vampire mythology, right? Right, the but the vampires in the Blade thing are more. Classic. I know, but I'm just saying in the very if in the in the canon of vampire mythology, Blade himself is a contradiction, right? He is half human, half That's true. vampire can walk all their strengths. What do they say in the in the Wesley movie? All their strengths, none of their weaknesses. None of their weaknesses. Right? All at the same time. So I just thank you for allowing me to go down this rabbit hole this morning. I mean, John. that was great. By the way, this is it's a good series. Do you, is there a chance do you think this is a one and done for Mahershala Ali and at the end let's say this let's just say this is what the movie's about that it's like a passing of a torch to his daughter and the daughter become a part of the young adventures or something like that. <laughs> okay, here here's the thing. It is possible. It is possible that they're doing that. I would hate it because how can you pass the torch when you haven't started the yeah, race? Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But I mean, like, like, like it's one thing. Like, look, I'm not looking forward to Ironheart, okay? But there is an argument to be made there, right? Robert Downey Jr.'s Tony Stark had been around in the MCU for over a decade, multiple, multiple, multiple movies. So if you do want to bring in, and you know, well, the jury's out about whether it'll work or not. But if you want to have that character then pass the torch, I get it. Mahershala, I really hope they're not using this movie, which is literally the starting gate of Mahershala Ali in the MCU, to also be the one that he passes the torch. That, I think, will piss a lot of people off. And quite frankly, I think it would be a bad move. It's, it, I only bring that up because of his age, right? He's And also how long he's been waiting to make this movie. I don't think he wants to wait a couple more years to make a second one or whatever. He wants to probably move on. But we'll see. We'll see what happens with this. All right, guys. <laughs> with that down, let's move on to this, shall we? You know, on top of the Grammys, there was also the Saturn Awards. Uh, happened over this weekend. Somebody in this room is actually the recipient of a Saturn Award, oh. and it's not Jonathan. Uh, hey, well, hey, you know, you never know. I mean, none of the rest of us either. That's Robert hey. Myronette's got a Saturn hey. Award. But at the Saturn Award, something kind of interesting mm -hmm. happened. We kind of now live in this odd period of time where we're, everybody's getting really thirsty for some Deadpool 3 actual news. Tons of speculation has been happening. Tons of theorizing. All this kind of stuff. What does this behind-the-scenes picture mean and everything? We're actually looking for some solid, actual, functioning information. Tangibility. Tangibility. The tangibilization of this movie. Well, there, there is no better source to get that from, other than maybe Ryan Reynolds himself, than Kevin Feige. And while Kevin Feige didn't say anything this weekend, he certainly wore something, which was what looked to be kind of a Deadpool Wolverine official Marvel hat. We got this image, Jonathan? Yeah, got a few. We got anything that's a little bit more blown up in there? Or if we uh, see if we can blow that up a can, bit more. Uh, I can zoom and enhance. Okay, okay, first of all. It's like Blade Runner. <laughs> that looks like a, um, what, what's a, a Funko Pop logo. Yeah. But I like it. It's cool, man. I like it a lot. Now that just because he's wearing the hat does that this does not mean before everybody's too excited this does not necessarily mean that is the official logo of Deadpool three okay let's just be maybe it is but don't think that just because he's wearing that that is an automatic thing now what's also very interesting is that as he was walking off stage the cameras got a glimpse of the back of his hat which do we have that yeah there it is which if you're thinking hey clear that up we can't read it nobody can read it. Now, there's been some wild speculation online about what it might say. Now, the top line is obviously Marvel Studios, right? That's that's clear. That's the logo. Underneath, that says Deadpool. <clears throat> but then what does it say underneath that? Some people are saying that they think it means it says Wolverine something. Others are saying it says Cars for Sale. <laughs> like C-A-R-S, the number four sale. Now, the reason that some people think that says Cars for Sale is because there's a supposed synopsis running around that suggests Deadpool 3 is about Deadpool having suffered some career setbacks, has decided to hang it up and retire as a superhero, and now sells used cars. When something happens that presents a threat, he goes off and finds Wolverine to team up with that. I have a feeling that's a fake thing. I, I don't know. Let's be clear. I don't know that that's a fake thing. I'm just saying I think, I'm guessing it's a fake thing that probably Disney itself has put out. I think we're going to see... I think in the coming weeks, we're going to see about eight or nine different very contradictory synopsises coming out for Deadpool 3. But again, 
Uh, I love the logo. I don't think it actually tells us anything at all, but it's kind of cool seeing Kevin Rob now going out in public, sporting some merch and stuff Dude. like that. What did you think about it? Well, I, I have to admit, John, when these pictures started to show up on the internet, I was doing cursory searches like somebody must have taken a picture of the back of his hat. I looked everywhere. I'm like, how do you? No one had it. There was no yeah. picture. I love the logo. I love the logo. And if the reports are true or rumors are true, we will be catching a glimpse of this next week, the Super Bowl, if they're going to have a spot. 100% they're going to have a spot. Uh, I, we've talked about it before, 100%. So we'll probably get a name then. But I love the fact that our first piece of Deadpool marketing was on Kevin Feige's mm -hmm. noggin. <laughs> and uh, I love this logo. I think this, I love logos that you can put on t-shirts or baseball hats and you immediately know what they are. Yeah. And, and this is the kind of logo just as a Marvel comics fan. I mean, dude, I was reading a Marvel omnibus this weekend, by the way, I hadn't read it. It's really good. Um, um, this is so cool. I mean, I, I saw this and last night. I was looking at who's winning, and I was looking at the Grammys and waiting for Taylor Swift to announce the name of her new album, and I was waiting for all this stuff. But then this was like coming on and going, oh, my God. You know, and I, I'm like, I want this low. I want to buy this hat. You know, when, when, when WandaVision had the sword, when Monica Rambeau was wearing the sword-like logo, they, they had those sword sweatshirts available, the gray right, and black. Yeah. Those. I was Johnny on the spot, and I... Wore him on the show. I mean, as soon as I got that thing, WandaVision was still running, and I had that sweatshirt. I'm like, this is badass. I fell asleep on a live stream wearing that shirt for eight hours, <laughs> and uh, I was so happy. I remember that. <laughs> That's a true story. Um, but um, but uh, really? it was an eight-hour yeah. stream, and I fell asleep after the stream was over he and forgot to turn my camera off. with him sleeping. But, but, and it just kept... I know. We have a um, video of you sleeping. But too. it's great. I mean, that logo's great. I want to get it. I'm really excited. And I wanted to see the name. Like, it says Deadpool 3, but did it say anything on the other side of Deadpool yeah, 3? I don't know. And why couldn't anyone get that picture? Well, you know, we were, Jonathan and I were talking about that before the show. It's like, it's like nobody behind the sta sta on behind stage had a camera. It's like, that's probably a place they discouraged people having cameras yeah, out. Of course. But what hey, about man, the red carpet? Guess. You should have been there, Rob. You won He's one. He's forward on the red carpet. I, I don't know. I would have gone up to talk to him. I, I, you know what? I'm going to just pure guess. I'm going to guess within the next 24 hours, a picture will, will surface. I hope so. Somebody yeah. somewhere snapped a photo of Kevin. Or Biden unless he away. had bag men with him. Yeah. You know, was, uh, going on and taking everyone's cameras, going, let me see your camera and pulling out their digital. And stomping on them. Yeah. You know, throwing their phones to the ground, stomping on them. Was there a them? second photographer on the grassy knoll? I, As the Kevin photo Feige says hello. Yes. Here's the, get that reference. Find out. All right. Guys, with that down, let's move on to this, shall we? Stick it in the world of the MCU for a minute. You know, WandaVision has kind of... I mean, Miss Marvel was fantastic, too, but WandaVision was the first Marvel MCU show to hit Disney+. Plus. And to this day, I don't think you're going to get a lot of people disagree. Some people obviously will, but it, it's still the gold standard for Marvel on television. I mean, it is It is still, as I look back, you know, I rewatched a little bit of it, some of the middling episodes when I was uh, kind of hanging at home this weekend. And like, that show is just bloody brilliant. It's such a great show. And of course, Vision was the Vision part of WandaVision. And it had a very, I love the show, but kind of an odd ending for Vision in that show with White Vision just going, I'm just going to go hang out with Dr. Manhattan on Mars somewhere or something. Right. I mean, I, I don't know. But a lot of questions and rumors have been happening since the ending of that show that as more and more time passes, people believe that we're just not going to see Vision anymore. You guys remember there were reports of them doing a Vision Quest show, mm -hmm. <laughs> but nothing there ever materialized. And as more and more time has passed on, and it, as it looks, as Ray brought up earlier, that more and more the MCU is just about passing batons now and, and trying to move on to another generation, which is a mistake on their part. <laughs> not that you shouldn't do that a little bit, but... In general, a lot of people have doubted that we're going to see Paul Bettany again. Well, apparently Paul Bettany himself has now put that to rest. This comes to us from CBR talking about Bettany being at a uh, panel. He said this, Bettany confirmed at a panel at Megacon 2024 that he will definitely return as Vision in the MCU in some fashion. When asked by a fan if he is returning as Vision, uh, he says, in any way, shape or form, the question was, Paul Bettany paused for a moment and replied, well, yeah, I mean, why wouldn't I? Yes, 100%. Yes. So. That's one Avenger. Yeah, there's one Avenger. We got one. Get them lunchboxes ready. So Vision 
is going to come back, which raises the question, in what way, right? I While I love the Vision character, I don't think the audience is looking for a Vision standalone movie. With Bob Iger back and saying, hey, we need to cut down a bit on how much MC we're trying to put on Disney+. Plus." I don't know if a Vision Disney Plus series is in the cards. So does that mean he returns as a secondary character in other movies? Which, by the way, being a secondary character gets a bad rap because some of my favorite characters in movies and TV shows are excellent secondary characters. So then that becomes a question. Where does he come back? How does he deal with the reported loss, fall from grace, and death of Wanda? Does he come? Some people believe he might come back as one in Wonder Man. There's some canonical comic connections there between Wonder Man and Vision. Some people think he'll just maybe come back as a character and as a secondary, like Black Widow used to in Captain America movies. Maybe he'll start showing up in Sam's movies. I don't know any connection between them, but whatever. They were both Avengers for a period of time. All I'll say is this: I love Paul Bettany. I have loved Paul Bettany ever since A Knight's Tale. I think this dude is just pure money. I love seeing him on screen, and I really love the Vision. Vision, who has given us, I think, the greatest line in the history of the MCU. What is love if not, what is it? Uh, no, no, what is grief if not love persevering? Or what, it, yeah, something something along those lines. What best lines ever. I mean, it's just fantastic. Although, Rob, I think Vision represents a a problem within the MCU which is a lot of the characters in the MCU are super overpowered, right? Like Thor just keeps getting bigger and bigger, like as far as power wise and stuff. Eventually they made Iron Man that his suit was not science anymore. It was just pure fantasy magic that he could literally do anything. Uh, They're talking about Shang-Chi, them moving Shang-Chi's power levels way up. You had Wanda, who couldn't be stopped by anybody. You got Vision, who a lot of people, a a lot of comic apologists will just argue, in the world of the MCU proper, excluding the the cosmic, there is simply nobody who can beat Vision. People, some people. But he doesn't have the soul stone anymore. Right. So I would also be very curious, but you know, once they brought back the white vision, he seemed pretty damn powerful. Yeah. (laughs) And see, so my I I want to see Paul Bettany back. I want to see Vision back. I just hope. I mean, I don't want them to pull an Incredible Hulk where they completely nerf him. But, I mean, at the same time, you can't have every single one of your characters is the most powerful being in the world at the same time. I don't know. What do you think about what Paul Bettany said? Well, I I think the way he said it is perfectly fine to me. I'm like, of course. Why wouldn't you bring Vision back? Vision is, is such a, you know, to me, when I was growing up, the Vision and Scarlet Witch as a team, as a married couple or whatever they were they were a, a cornerstone of the marvel cinematic universe or the marvel comic universe and as they moved along i mean then we had you know avengers disassembled where wanda went around the bend and then it was house of m and all that stuff was great you know and and um i think that that having vision i love vision i love the design of this character um i think he's great paul bettany like you said i've always loved paul bettany Knight's Tale, even Master and Commander. He's Russell Crowe's uh, Captain Aubrey's yep. best friend. He's just a great actor and a great presence, and I really love him as the Vision. I love his voice. You know, he was great as Jarvis and then moving him. So I really like that his character kind of represents the progression of the MCU. Yeah. And I think if they bring him back and refine him uh, moving forward, he's going to be uh, a linchpin of, of – because in a way – He's the closest thing to a classic Avenger now, other than the, like you yeah. said, and 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 he there's a certain nobility to him, and a certain gravitas that he brings with, and he's also a remnant of, of he, he, Tony Stark created him, mm-hmm. so I I really like the character. I think he's got to be part of the MCU moving forward, whether there's a Vision Quest show or not. I think it's it's great that he's going to come back. Yeah, to your point about the gravitas that he brings, a movie I think both you and I say this that. I, my appreciation grows for every time I see it is is the second Avengers movie, Avengers 100%. Age of Ultron. 100%. That scene near the end of the film where the battle's done, Vision and now Ultron standing there, and they have this little exchange. It's so good. You know, Paul Bettany and James Spader, you know, doing this little exchange, ultimately ending with Vision wiping out 
Ultron, yes. but it was it was a, a really beautiful moment uh, with him. I was just gonna say, like last night, uh, Multiverse of Madness was on TV, and I watched the rest of it from where I caught it, and Wanda is <laughs> so strong in that. Oh, oh no, they they made her ridiculously crazy powerful. That where she's chasing them in the tunnels. That that part was frightening. I I like that movie a little bit more. <laughs> than I that. listen, listen. I I I, I like. Doctor Strange: The Multiverse of Madness. I think it was definitely lower tier MCU. I don't think it was great, I, and I certainly have my problems with it. I mean, hundred yeah. percent, I have my problems with it. But I mean, there's not, but again, you're talking about a lot of the overpower. Whether it's Thor, whether it's you know a Vision, uh, Wanda, Captain Marvel, Kevin well, Feige saying she's the most powerful character in the thing. Now we got this Gaia, this idiot character Gaia <laughs> running around that. I have the powers of all the, the Avengers. I, I mean, it's just they're just making everybody more and more and more and more and more powerful. The thing with Vision that I don't mind is he, he could be really powerful. At least you know how to defeat him. You just pull out that stone. He's a robot. Yeah, there's, but good there's, luck. There's some ways you can <laughs> just you know? pull out a stone. Yeah, yeah but I yeah, just, it's... I have a problem with the characters that are overpowered and you see no weakness or there is no way to defeat them. Mm. You know what I mean? Uh, all right, guys. Well, with that down, we still got to talk about a couple things here. Jeremy Renner saying he's ready to pee Hawkeye again whenever they need him. Uh, Sholo from Blue Beetle is reaffirming that he is coming back as Blue Beetle in the brand new DCU. But is that a mistake? I kind of think it is. We'll talk about why. And Henry Cavill's Argyle is flopping hard at the box office. We're going to talk about that and a few things more. But before we do, we're going to take a quick moment and thank a couple of sponsors of today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast. Our friends, my mobile service provider, and they should be yours, Mint Mobile and Masterclass. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this video, Mint Mobile. On average, it takes about 30 days for a person to break their New Year's resolution. So if saving money was on your 2024 list, your odds aren't looking that great. Luckily, I have a 100% guaranteed way to save you money this year. Just switch to Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for $15 a month. I've told you guys many times that after switching to Mint Mobile, I am spending less than a third on my cell bill than I used to with a major carrier. Say goodbye to your overpriced wireless plans, jaw-dropping monthly bills, and unexpected overages. All Mint plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. And don't worry about having to change phones or numbers. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. So guys, to get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash cam. That's mintmobile.com slash campia. Cut your wireless bills to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's episode, Masterclass. Everyone, it's a new year. So picture that thing that you've always wanted to learn. Now, picture learning it from a person who's literally one of the best in the world at it. And that's what you get with Masterclass. This year, learn from the best to become your best with Masterclass. Don't just talk about improving. Masterclass helps you actually do it. Because Masterclass offers over 180 world-class instructors. So whether you want to master negotiation with Chris Voss, like I did, think like a boss with Martha Stewart, or learn the art of storytelling from the man himself, Neil Gaiman. Masterclass has you covered. Because with Masterclass, you get unlimited access to intimate one-on-one -on -one classes with the world world's best. At Masterclass, there are over 200 classes to pick from, with new classes being added every month. And if you're a viewer of The John Campus Show, you probably love movie making, storytelling, television. So you'd be totally interested in things like screenwriting from Aaron Sorkin, learn developing original TV series from Stranger Things' as The Duffer Brothers, or maybe you like the music side of movies, well you can learn film scoring from Hans Zimmer. And right now, our listeners will get an additional 15% off an annual membership at Masterclass masterclass.com slash campia. Get 15% off right now at masterclass.com slash campia. Masterclass.com slash campia. And thank you to our friends at Mint Mobile and Masterclass for sponsoring today's episode of the John Campia Show podcast. All right, guys, listen, we still have a few things to talk about here. The Jeremy Renner situation, Blue Beetle, uh, Argyle. Indulge me for a second, though. I, I want to just touch on this quick. I want to touch on this quick. The uh, new Donald Glover series, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, debuted on uh, Amazon. 
this week. And and before I started watching it, I saw because a bunch of people saw it before I did. I think when I looked, maybe it's gone up, maybe it's gone down. But it had like on Amazon had like two stars. I'm like, oh, that's weird. Because it's all the same people who made Atlanta, and Atlanta is great. Same director, same producers, same right. I mean, it's every it's the Atlanta team, and Atlanta's great. So here's the thing. Anna and I watched the first four episodes of Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And I got to say, I really quite like it. I think it's quite good. Now, I say that as somebody who really liked Atlanta. Because this show is very much Atlanta. It's Atlanta with spies. That's what it is. It's Atlanta (laughs) with spies. Donald Glover's just playing a different character, but the tone, the pacing, the humor of it. And as somebody who likes Atlanta, I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's not my favorite show that's out there right now, but I'm enjoying it. But I can totally see why there are a lot of people who are kind of disillusioned with this show. Because while it's got the tone of Atlanta and I, I think it's it's good and it's got, you know, Donald Glover in there. I mean, you got some great guest stars, John Turturro, Ron Perlman, whole, like wonderful, like a scars guard <clears throat> in there. You know what it's not? It ain't Mr. and Mrs. Smith. That's one of the things that really stood out to me as I was watching. It's like, okay, this is this is good for what it is, but this is not Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Now, look, I don't mean to sound like one of these online crybabies saying it's not just like the movie I remembered. No, 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 no. Hear, hear me out here. There is nothing about this show that is remotely like the Mr. and Mrs. Smith movie. The premise is completely different. The characters are com- obviously completely different. The tone is completely different. I mean, it it is a completely different show. I mean, if at least had the same premise, you know, a husband and wife who have been married for a while only to discover that both of them are spies for opposing agencies. If you did that and yet the tone was different, all the other stuff was different, still a lot like Atlanta, then I could go, oh yeah, I could see why you're calling him Mr. Wynn Smith because the premise is the same. This isn't the same premise. <laughs> it's a totally different show. This show should not be called Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I, I guarantee you, if they had just called this show something else, call it uh, Spies in a Time of Love, or I don't know, you just call it anything, I think the response to it would be a little bit more positive because I think a lot of people, understandably, you call your show Mr. and Mrs. Smith, people are coming into the show with a little bit of, obviously they know it's going to be a little bit different. Obviously, this is a show version. But... I think a lot of people, understandably, went in with a little bit of an expectation of this is going to be like the Mr. and Mrs. Smith movie. And it's not at all. And I, I don't think they should have called this show Mr. and Mrs. Smith. It's still, I get, and I'm enjoying it. It's still got uh, better ratings than True Detective on Rotten Tomatoes. Does it? See, yeah. I don't get that. because Well, I mean, that's the thing. Who cares about what Rotten Tomatoes know, does on know, TV because just, they can't verify people right. voting? True Detective... Uh, Night Country, is that what this one's called? Yeah. I think it's been great so far. But, uh, but Miss, oh, this thing is not Mr. And Mrs. Smith. And Thursday, baby, that crappy show Halo I love comes back. I'm actually yeah. looking forward to it. I like the trailer. Thursday. But anyway, I, I just wanted to vent on that for a little bit. It's not a big topic. I just wanted to vent on that for a second. All right. Guys, with that all down, let's get on to our next main topic here, shall we? And that is this. I love me Jeremy Renner. I love Jeremy Renner. I, th- <laughs> I think he's great in everything. He does, whether it's the town, whether it's Hurt Locker, whether he's Hawkeye, whether he's a man, that tag movie he did. (laughs) I thought he was wonderful in that. I really enjoyed that. Oh, I enjoyed him in that. (laughs) Now, obviously, it was a year ago that uh, a little over a year ago now that we all got like some really disturbing news that Jeremy Renner was involved in a horrific uh, accident that left him a lot. Some people wondering if he was going to make it. Well, he's back. Then we were wondering, will Mayor of Kingstown still continue? It is. We got a new season of Mayor of Kingstown coming, and he's he's committed to that. But what about Hawkeye? I mean, a lot of us have wondered whether he would be Hawkeye just at the end of the Hawkeye series, which was, again, nothing but another Passing the Torch show. <laughs> but will Hawkeye be back? Well, according to Jeremy Renner, you know, I, I expect him to say something like, you know what? I had a lot of years playing that character. I'm looking forward to new challenges or whatever. But that's not what Jeremy Renner's saying. He's saying he's ready to pick up the bow and arrow again. This comes from the folks at The Hollywood Reporter who said this. 
Jeremy Renner is opening up about whether he's down to reprise his role as Hawkeye in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He spoke to Entertainment Tonight recently, more than a year after his near-fatal snowplow accident on January 1st, 2023, about potentially returning to the Avengers franchise. He said the following, I'm always game, Renner said. I'm going to be strong enough, that's for sure. I'll be ready. The mayor of Kingstown actor who broke 30 bones after being run over by a 14,300-pound snowcat at his home in Reno, Nevada. Whew. And he survived that. You are already a boss. He's an <laughs> Avenger for sure. It's like, yeah, I got run over by a snowplow. I mean, yeah, that's <laughs> Avengers level stuff right there, right? All right. Now, this is not like the Paul Bettany comment where Paul Bettany, when asked, are you returning? And he said 100% yes. This is not that. This is him saying, hey, listen, I'm strong enough. I'm game. I'm down. I'm ready to go, right? It doesn't sound like something he would say unless he kind of had some kind of an idea about whether we might not see him come back. Listen, I think the Marvel Cinematic Universe 100% needs Jeremy Renner, and I'll tell you why. Now, some of you who've been watching my show for any period of time, some of you might be saying, well, John, wait a minute, wait a minute. Have you already said that we didn't really need a standalone Hawkeye show and a standalone Hawkeye movie? Why are you saying that the MCU absolutely needs Jeremy Renner? Well, because... It's something I said a little bit earlier in the show. Set good and great secondary characters will be the difference between a decent show and a great show. Fantastic secondary characters will be the difference between a good movie and a legendary movie. I think characters like Black Widow and like Hawkeye have kind of given a lot of the DNA to the Marvel Cinematic Universe without ever having to have a show or a movie named after them. Obviously, we do now. We have the Black Widow movie. We have the Hawkeye series. But... I just think he's such a part of the heartbeat of the MCU. And why do I think it's absolutely essential for him to come back now? Because so little of the MCU now is recognizable. With them going on a spending spree recently of just, let's kick out this new character and this new character and this new character. And by the way, a good healthy film franchise should always maintain a good set of the veterans while bringing in new blood here and there and have an, always have a nice, like a good basketball team, right? Mm-hmm. Got to have a good mix of the young bloods and the vets on the court at the same time. There is very little of the MCU with Chris Evans gone. He'll be back. With Robert Downey Jr. gone. He'll be back at some point. With Scarlett Johansson gone. Like, with, with all this happening, and, and Chris Hemsworth, Thor's not gone, but he's saying he's stepping back for a while. He's going to be taking a break. There is so little that is even recognizable about the MCU anymore that I think having a Jerry, Jeremy Renner as a Hawkeye is vitally important. Secondly, I was talking a little bit earlier in the vision things that one of the problems of the MCU is that it seems like every character they bring in, they have to make them more powerful than the last character. Every character has now the power of a million blazing <laughs> black holes, right? <laughs> it's a good name for a, an adult film, by the way. I, 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 I call dibs on that one. So but I think having a character lock, like Hawkeye who is not to have the strength of a thousand burning suns. I think that's important. Now, yeah, we've got the street level stuff with Daredevil and everything coming in too, but I think having a character, a veteran character in this thing, like a Hawkeye becomes that much more important. Hell, I don't know, maybe he kind of becomes the new Nick Fury of the MCU universe. I think he'd be kind of perfect for that. But anyway, Rob, I know he's not, he, had, he did not just make a definitive statement that 100% 2025 Hawkeye returns, but he's saying, I'm ready to go. I'm strong enough. I'm up for it. Let's go. I think the MCU needs him for multiple reasons. I don't know. What did you think about his comments? And do you think we'll see him return? Well, 100%, I think you're absolutely right on both counts. I mean, if if nothing else, if if it's hard for him to be mobile the way Hawkeye has been in the past, make him a statistician. Make him make him the head of the team. You but know, Hawkeye's... The, I mean, he comes from S.H.I.E.L.D. He, he, he'd worked with Nick Fury and, um, and uh, Natasha... They know each other. He's been a field operative for a lot longer than any of the Avengers were. And for being a general, you know, calling the shots, I could see Jeremy Renner has that gravitas. You know, he brings with him his Hurt Locker persona as well and things from, like, the town. I, I need. We're going to go hurt some people. Well, I need to buy a car. You know, <laughs> whatever. That's just, Jeremy Renner is that guy. You know, you know I'll get my keys or whatever he says. You know what I like about uh, him playing Hawkeye is his mannerisms. There's always a sense of confidence 
Like, um, uh, but he's really funny too, and he'll do it straight face. Like, if you saw him and like Steve Rogers, like having a conversation without knowing anything about him, you would think Hawkeye was the strongest, like, uh, the strongest hero, like, between them. Just by the way he talks, the way he, he has those quick comebacks. I like. He's the way very he's, confident. Yeah, he's very confident, and he also knows where he's at. Like, Wait, if now, it, I don't, I don't mean to cross the streams uh -huh. here, but I think there's a role here. I think there's a Batman-like role for Hawkeye. And what I mean by a Batman-like role was kind of the same thing like when Stephen Amell was playing Arrow, he was kind of the Batman of that universe. Like he's the one guy there who has no powers, but everybody else in that universe was, you don't mess with him. Kind of like like, like Batman's the one guy in, in the Justice League thing, he got no powers. Who's the one guy everybody in the Justice League right. knows you don't mess with? Batman. I, I almost think it would be kind of cool if he could kind of play that role too. Also, psychologically, they haven't delved really delved far into this, but during the snap, he watched his family disintegrate before his eyes. Oh yeah. He turns around, they're gone, and he went on a tear when he just he lost his soul and was just murdering the criminal Hundreds underworld across around the, the world. world. I mean, he was killing many, many people, and that you know now he's got his. What's it like to have lost everything for half a decade and then suddenly it's returned to you? And yet you still lost Natasha. So so he's not only battle hardened, but he's had to deal with a lot emotionally. And that can be something they could lean into. And that's probably in terms of being a leader forged him to understanding things a lot of other people don't. And it was nice seeing so. him in Echo, for sure. Just seeing his little part in Echo. It's just good to see him. Well, I can't remember. Did we actually see him in Echo there? Or yeah, did yeah. we see his masked character? No, no, no. I can't remember. He took off his mask. Did and he? he said, and he said something to her. Like he told her like like to leave or something like That's that. how non-memorable the Echo I show know, is to I me. Know, that I, I that can't even last, remember him last. being there and taking his uh taking his mask off. I'm trying to find this one thing, although I'm having a, a problem with it. I saw somebody in live chat mention, I think Jeremy Renner and John look a little bit alike. Well, of course, I always I, I posted this <laughs> picture before, jokingly. Let's see if you can bring it up, Jonathan. But so yeah, that's uh, little. Very few people know that uh, I was up for that. Was uh, this was at the auditions for Hawkeye? I I came in second to Jeremy oh, wow. Renner. Second, you yeah. could be brothers. It's kind of like Chris Farley going for the uh, Chippendale spot against Patrick Swayze. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so there. <laughs> yeah, we do. We he looks like he could be my big brother. I get that. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? We've talked a lot, uh, you know, over the last number of years about. The absolute abysmal failure that is the DCEU, uh, despite the fact that I liked almost every single movie that was in it, other than Wonder Woman 84 and uh, Birds, of Birds of Prey. Those are the only two movies I didn't like. I liked every single other one of them, including Blue Beetle. I thought Blue Beetle was a fun movie, man. Yep. Not, not the top two or three DCEU movies, but I had a really good time watching this movie. That was a very pleasant, fun little film. Um that I enjoyed and Sholo from uh, the uh, Cobra Kai. I thought he did a really good job in the role. I really did. He had charm. He, he, he has an instant likability about him, but make no mistake about it. Like every other DCU film, it underperformed financially. Every other DCU film that didn't have the name Wonder Woman or Aquaman attached to it, it underperformed. More than that, it completely tanked. The movie made a grand total of $130 million. Not opening weekend, not domestically, made $130 million worldwide, total. It lost money. <laughs> Even though they kept the budget, production budget, that's fairly reasonable, when it was all said and done, they lost money. It was another in a long line of failures, particularly in the last five years, the DCEU. It just was. Then came whispers and straight out statements that James Gunn was actually going to bring Sholo and his Blue Beetle into the DCU, the brand new DC Cinematic Universe. And I'll be honest with you, I never really expected that to happen. But now, according to comments from the actor himself, that's exactly what's happening. This comes just from the folks at Screen Rant who said the following. Per Screen Rant, the actor said he was confident that the character's return will be soon, but he can't say exactly how it, that will be. He said this, I know we'll see Blue Beetle again when it comes uh, in the form of Blue Beetle 2 or whatever. Uh, Matt, 
I always mispronounce his name. Mare Juena. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, it's been really great to work alongside James Gunn and Peter Safran, who have graciously folded us into their new universe, even though it wasn't part of what they came up with. It's an honor. Uh, now, where Blue Beetle heads in the future, I don't know, but I can say confidently that we will see him soon. Okay. Now, <clears throat> Blue Beetle isn't the only remnant of the DCEU that's going to be coming over. because we know that Peacemaker and some of that cadre is, is coming over as well. And I think that's kind of where the line starts. Amanda stops. Waller? Well, like that's part of the peacekeeper, yeah. like uh, I mean, that thing, right? So peacekeeper and and some of the you know characters there coming over, but I think that's it, right? <laughs> I gotta say, I think this is a mistake. But John, I thought you said you like Blue Beetle. I do. John, I thought you liked Sholo in the role. I really did. But that doesn't mean it's the right decision to bring him over into a brand new DCU. Well, John, you said you like, you're okay with the idea of them bringing Peacemaker over. I do, but there's one major fundamental difference between the Peacemaker situation and the Blue Beetle one. Peacemaker was a smash hit. Was an absolute, unmitigated, crushing hit for them on Max. Massively successful for them. As much as I look like Blue Beetle, there is no way to spin it it was an abject failure. Even though I like the film, I'll defend this film. I had fun at this film, but it was a failure. It's kind of like the same thing. I love Man of Steel. I'll defend it all day long. But a lot of people didn't like that movie, and I can't deny that fact. This movie was a financial bomb. This movie has, through no fault of its own, the stench of the failure of the DCU on it. Peacemaker does not. Now, I, I would have also been totally fine if James Gunn wasn't bringing Peacemaker over. That, I would have understood that, too, but they're doing it. Okay, I can see it's like keep it limited. But the Blue Beetle character, Rob, was part of the theatrical DCEU. It was a part of the run of failure after failure after failure. It only, I mean, my God, nobody saw the Marvels, and Marvels made way more money than this movie, and nobody saw the Marvels. I, I just can't help but think, as, as good as I thought Sholo was, what's the best decision, what's right for the business, if you're going to use Blue Beetles to recast it, have a fresh new Blue Beetle, don't risk bringing that stench of failure over. Um, I, I got to say, I think this, I've liked almost every decision James Gunn has made. I can't help but think that this might be a mistake. I don't know, Rob, what do you think? Well, I think you, I think the way they're going to do it is bring him into Peacemaker. They bring him into Peacemaker, and then no one's going to say anything because Peacemaker is the one place. Look, Amanda Waller's there. It's the one place, and I think Blue Beetle would fit right in. I mean, <laughs> it may, it, a little body, you know, a little uh, different than what we got from the the Ernest family man that the Blue Beetle character, you know, the son. But uh, but I think that that's a way. If they added him to Superman Legacy, it wouldn't work. I don't think it would work. It would it would it would dilute. It would be a problem. But if you bring him into some place, you backdoor him in through Blue uh, Blue Beetle comes in through Peacemaker, and, and he's written well. Everybody would forget about the fact that he was in the other universe, and I think it's a way to do it legitimately that nobody would complain about. You try and say he's, you put him in Superman Legacy, just just my own Twitter feed. I I, I would turn Twitter off. I, I couldn't even deal with it, with what people would say about this. But I, I, I really liked the character. I thought, like you, the movie was a lot of fun. Um, look, I still miss Ted Cord. I love Ted Cord and Blue Beetle, uh, Blue Beetle and Booster Gold together. But I think this is the way you could do something like that. And I think that's why it, it leads me to believe that James Gunn already had that plan in his mind to bring in Blue Beetle into Peacemaker somehow. Because remember, originally, Blue Beetle was made under the auspices of a streaming movie. It was not supposed to be theatrical, which leads me to also believe that somehow Blue Beetle was involved in the development of Peacemaker because, because Peacemaker was a streaming show. I'll bet you there were talks previous to the, DC, the new DCEU that Blue Beetle was somehow going to be a part of Peacemaker because mm -hmm. they were both going to be streaming shows then they moved him over and made it a theatrical movie so things changed but i think that probably this is just a theory i don't know if this is true but i would imagine that james gunn is continuing on with what he'd already come up with i mean character I don't think wise this is new. 
I think he fits in very well. The the problem though is power level. Right. Right? Like vigilante can't fight Blue Beetle. I mean, I know the Beyonce, but you got totally different power level characters, right? Um, and all that kind of but still it'd be interesting to see. Again, I just think it's a, a mistake to bring a living iteration of the theatrical self. By the way, I saw somebody in the live chat point out a fallacy that a lot of people keep pointing out saying, but James Gunn said Blue Beetle was the first official DCU movie. No, he didn't. He specific, and then he later went back to, just so in case anybody was confused, he later went on to clarify. He said Blue Beetle himself was kind of their first new character. He did not say the movie was a DCU movie. There's, there's a vast, vast, vast big difference. And he went on to clarify that. So, like, it could be that we're going to get Sholo playing Blue Beetle, but the events of the Blue Beetle may not, the, the events of the Blue Beetle movie Right. May not count as canon in the new DCU, right? And a viewer just, uh, we just had a pop up there saying that you could introduce the character in a Booster Gold film, which is the obvious way to go. I mean, have they announced that there's going to be a Booster Gold? Well, remember before, like when AT&T still owed, owned Warner Brothers, before the sale to uh, to Discovery, there was there was a lot of whispers going around. Oh, that yeah, they they've were been trying to, Blue I have Beetle, a friend Booster who wrote a Gold script movie. for a Blue Beetle movie. They've yeah. been trying to do it for a long time. But, but you know, I don't know, like somebody just pointed out I love the Ted Cord, you know, booster gold angle. But, you know, who knows? I don't know. I mean, I could see it happening. I uh, think again, it's Me saying I think it's a mistake does not mean I don't like Blue Beetle. I do. Or that I don't like Show and Roll. I think he was delightful. But it's part of something that failed. And I think you need as much of a clean slate as possible, even though you're already bringing something over in the Peacemaker group. But at least that group wasn't like a huge smash hit. So I, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Maybe James Gunn has got a brilliant idea for it. All right, guys, with that down, let's move on to this, shall we? Oh, boy, one of the movies that I have been most excited about, Henry Cavill's Argyle. Now, you guys know I'm a Henry Cavill guy. I love Henry Cavill. I love Matthew Vaughn. I love Sam Rockwell. I love Samuel Jackson. I love Bryce Dallas Howard. I love spy movies. I love mysteries with a twist. <laughs> Argyle. <laughs> Argyle looked like a movie, like it had all the pieces. And speaking of Peacemaker, John Cena's in there. <laughs> had all the pieces. Man. Could not wait. So wait, I did not. I went opening night to go see Peacemaker, or to go see Argyle, I should say. <laughs> I got out of that mess. <laughs> this movie sucks. Oh my God, it's bad. It's so bad. And like Henry Cavill's arc, Henry Cavill's in like seven minutes of the movie. I, oh, well, John, that's why you didn't like, you just want more. Hey, listen, that's seven more minutes of Henry Cavill than any other movie the last couple of years has given me. So I'll, I'll take every second of Henry Cavill. But this movie was awful. The best way I can describe it is the first act, like the first one third of the movie is Kingsman. I kind of liked it. I kind of liked the first act, just like I liked the first Kingsman. And it felt like the first Kingsman. Act two and three felt like Kingsman two. That movie sucked. And it just went way off the rails and became absolutely stupid and absolutely no logic whatsoever. And it's, and it's a terrible movie. Absolutely terrible movie. Filled, made by people I love, cast with people that I love. And I, I still thought this movie was absolute trash. Just terrible. <laughs> Here's the thing, too, about it, though. How did it do? Oh, boy. Well, the reported budget, there's been some, some arguments about this, but as of right now, the official reported budget of Argyle, if you take a look at this, it's $200 million. <laughs> wow. The marketing budget... Hovered around 60. Now, I've seen reports of 110. I've seen reports as low as 40. More of the reports I see say it was around a $60 million market. Okay, so $60 million marketing budget. You're talking about expenses in the neighborhood of $260 million, which means you're looking at a movie that needed $370 to $400 million to break even. Opening weekend came. We had talked the other week that the long-range projection said, uh-oh, uh-oh. Argyle is only projected to make $25 million. And we're like, that would be a disaster. If it makes $25 million, well, don't worry. It didn't make $25 million. It made less. 
made $18 million at the box office. All right. So, and and the word of mouth isn't going to be great. So don't expect it to pick up momentum. <laughs> and again, I say this to somebody who loves Matthew Vaughn. <laughs> and I love Henry Cavill. I love Sam Rockwell. I love Bryce Dallas Howard. But this, this movie making $18 million on its opening weekend. First of all, all these arguments that, well, the, the new DCU can't possibly succeed if Henry Cavill's not Superman. Well, apparently nobody gives a shit about Henry Cavill except me. <laughs> What's wrong with the rest of you? Henry Cavill is a treasure. A global treasure, I tell you. Man. But ain't nobody cared to go see all seven minutes of him in Argyle or a CGI cat. By the way, it was funny. If you were saying, Ray, you would have got a kick out of this. Every I was in a theater. It was kind of a quiet theater. Not many people were in there, obviously. <laughs> but every time something real bad would happen to the cat, all you'd hear is like this long, slow clap. <laughs> oh, man. That yes. was you, man. <laughs> that was me. That was me in the background doing it. You would change seats all the way to the front. <laughs> <laughs> but you got a director with a proven track record, big name stars, you, you put Dua Lipa in the trailer. Dua Lipa's in like three minutes of the movie, but she's a big, big international star. Got her in the trailers there. Why did it flop so monumentally badly? You can't say because the movie was bad. People didn't know it was bad till opening weekend came. You had to go to the movie to find out it was bad. I mean, word of mouth is out now. So why didn't anybody buy tickets to go to it? I think it was a terrible marketing campaign. There's a lot of trailer. There was a lot of exposure out there. I saw billboards. I saw commercials. The trailer was good. But. It was better silent. It, it was, it was better. And it, I think at the end of the day, <coughs> it just said, ooh, this movie has a twist. Don't let the cat out of the bag was their big. Once you find out the secret, by the way, the secret's lame. It's not a big, it's not a big, what kind of thing. Like when Samuel Jackson goes, it's time for you to meet the real Agent Argyle. You see, they put that in R of the trailers, right? You're expecting some kind of like, what? Moment. I didn't, no, no. It's, it's just, half of you can probably figure out what the twist is. But what a twist. they didn't do much to entice the audience to go. People like Henry Cavill. People like Sam Rockwell. People like Bryce Dallas Howard. This is a bad sign. I hope that's not a bad sign. We're, we're only in January right now. We saw ISS and now this, and then this one's already a flop. Well, the, one, the thing with ISS was that they didn't market that movie at yeah, all. I'm like there saying. were no trailers for it. We saw like one trailer, like one time, but this is packed with stars. <laughs> and it's only January. And it's, <laughs> I, I don't know. Anyway, Rob, you, you haven't seen this movie yet, but you didn't have to see the movie to read the box office. Report. Well, that was the thing. I was excited to see it. And then the bad word of mouth was like, I can't, I can no longer, I don't have enough time left on, my, on planet earth <laughs> to go wow, to a man. movie that I know is not, that is generally considered to be not good. So I'll wait and catch up with it later. The thing that concerns me about a movie like this is this is another Apple production. Oh, yeah. They spent 200. By the way, just, I have to say, right, people in the live chat want to make sure you're up to date. We are in February, just, oh. so, just so you know. Oh, I'm sorry. We're it's actually February. February 5th. We've been in February oh. for a few days now. Just want to point that. Okay. Sorry, Rob. Go ahead. Keep going. I, I just think that, for one, I don't know why someone greenlit this particular movie at $200 million. I don't. And I know all the people involved, all the talent involved, all the actors involved, but this is a brand new IP. And obviously I would like to see IPs like this flourish, but I have to go back and say, if you want to look at an IP that and, 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 and emulate how that IP began, you've got to look at John Wick. You got to go back and look at John Wick as a, because that's pretty much the best new IP, five movies and a spinoff TV series, the continental. The way they spent that money, and they've never those the John Wick, especially John Wick two and three and four, uh, four, four movies. Well, there's ballerina coming out, right? Which is sorry, a spinoff. Uh, currently, we have yeah, four, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I meant five total. Sorry, but the the um, the idea is you don't spend a ton of money on something like this, and I think it's bad for the industry. I hate the fact, yeah, Apple's their 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 market cap is in the trillions of dollars, so this doesn't, you know affect them that much but it's bad for the industry that this is an original thing that matthew vaughn spearheaded using and putting together this tremendous talent which was amazing to see a movie like this not do well 
And if this movie was, why did this movie cost $200 million? I understand everyone get, uh, get paid. I'm not against that. But if you'd made this for $75 to $100 million, it would, it would mitigate your risk. And what we want is we want Apple to, they're top of the line. They're working with the best talent in the business. But they can't keep making $200 million movies that underperform. And it's really, it's really um, distressing to me. Because they're the one company that can that can take risks and chances, but if they take two hundred million dollar risks, it's not going to last very long. Just, I have to throw this in there. At the risk of it being a minor, I won't give a, it won't give away a story point here, okay? But at the risk of it being a minor spoiler, I don't care. And no, but none of you want to go see it. None of you are going to go see it. But I won't say who. But one of our good guy characters. This this is how stupid this movie is. And I, I granted, I'm saying this as a Canadian. One of the good guy characters, they're in a tough situation. Them, their fellow good guys against, ma they're massively outnumbered. So the good guy decides, you know what? I'm a bit of a skater. So I know what I'll do. They take two daggers and stick them in the bottom of their shoes, spill oil over the floor on a metal floor. And they start figure skating along the oil. And I'm just sitting there as a Canadian. I'm like, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. That's not how skating works. You can't, like, the, the blades would go right through the oil and just grind against the metal. And I'm just watching this like, is this supposed to be a cartoon? I mean, I, I didn't know because like the first act felt more like the first Kingsman's like little grounded. Like, what if this sort of happened? And then it just got like, oh, my God, so... Unbelievable. And I'm watching this thing. I'm like, this is one of the worst movies I've ever seen. This is one of the worst movies I've ever seen as they're like figure skating on oil. Disappointing. Oh my God, it's so bad. I, I mean, what I don't understand is, is, you know, there are producers in Hollywood that are consistently finding, taking chances on both new talent and turning out to turn out some bangers and then working with established talent and not spending $200 million. And I don't understand why that isn't I mean, I know it's hard to find good material, but there are producers out there that find consistently good material, and we see the results, and I just don't understand why more isn't, like, Matthew Vaughn makes it more difficult for himself to get another movie off the ground, and I just, I don't understand, I guess you take what you can, you, you, it's the old Jimmy Fallon, almost famous, get what you can, while you can, when you can. Oh yeah, and by the, <laughs> by the way. If you thought the post credit scene in Morbius was bad, oh. Matthew Vaughn comes along and says, hold my beer. And oh. the fact that there's even a post credit scene at all. Mm. And it's only January. <laughs> it's only January, <laughs> damn it. I'm sorry. That was just a brain fart, I guess. Now, right now, the one hope that, that if, thankfully, if you're one of the creative team behind um, Argyle, and you're like, we are the biggest flop of the year, and it's only February. The one glimmer of hope you have is like, Madam Web is just two weeks away. <laughs> <laughs> hey, have we done a Madam oh, Web check? Nice. That's going to come in here nice. and take like that well record check. from us. Yeah, like a wellness, wellness check, check on Madam Web's ticket sales. <laughs> I noticed none of us on our little app have added Madam Web to our our to our ticket. AMC list yeah. app, you know, yeah, that? you know, we've all got the AMC app, yeah. and we have each other as yeah, A-list so who we can, we can buy tickets for each other. But <laughs> none, none of us, us have it. None on of us own. are moving on. That. I am going to go see it. I'm curious to see it, but it's like, <laughs> well, it's like oh man, feeling it. bad. We're we should like make big Madam Web a meme movie, kind of like the AMC meme stocks, <laughs> just to help AMC out. Everybody go see Madam Web. Oh, we're going to see yeah, but there's no see it. It doesn't work because there's no return on your investment. Oh. oh. But yeah, it's like we may be the oh. biggest flop of the You're year. You're not a better person. Don't worry. Madam Web's coming. Yeah, anyway, guys. By, by the way, let me, let me say this, too. Let me say this. All film is subjective. Just because I hate it, it doesn't mean you will. As a matter of fact, you know how I gave the example that like act one of the movies kind of like Kingsman? It feels like Kingsman. And then act two and three feel like Kingsman 2. There are people who like Kingsman 2. And, and if you're one of those people that Seek like the second oh. Kingsman, which I thought was dog shit, but if you like the second Kingsman and hey, like I said, all films hit us all in different ways. So there's no reason for you not to. If you enjoyed it, great. And if you like the second Kingsman, then I can say with some confidence that I think there might be something in Argyle for you. And, and I say that honestly, like if, if you enjoy the second Kingsman, you may want to give Argyle a shot. If you're like me, 
and didn't like the second Kingsman, you might want to take a pass on Argyle, like most of you obviously did. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, but if you're if you're a Kingsman two fan, I think you will get more enjoyment out of Argyle than I did, and uh, and I'm jealous. I'm jealous of that that you'll get more enjoyment out of it than I did. Anyway, with that down, guys. Let's get on to the main reason we're here, the most important part, which is to take your comments and questions. Now, listen, before we do, though, we're going to take another quick second, thank another sponsor of today's episode. Super Bowl is right around the corner. We want to thank our sponsor, DraftKings. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this video, DraftKings. DraftKings, the leader in fantasy sports, just dropped a brand new app, Pick 6. Pick 6 is the newest way for you to get in on the fantasy football action with DraftKings. New customers can make their first NFL picks and get up to 100 bucks in Pick 6 credits if those picks lose. All you got to do is pick between two and six NFL players and choose if they're going to have more or less of that stat. For example, will a player have more or less than 100 rushing yards or will a player have more or less than one touchdown. Track your lineup and compete against others for a shot at huge cash prizes. So download the DraftKings Pick 6 app now and sign up with the code CAMPIA. New customers can get up to 100 bucks back in Pick 6 credits if your first football pick set loses. That's code CAMPIA only on DraftKings Pick 6. One offer per new customer. First qualifying pick set winnings less entry fees must generate negative number. Max reward up to $100 equal to amount of negative number. Issued in non-withdrawable pick six credits. Valid for pick six use only. Expire after one year. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. 18 plus in most eligible states, but age varies by jurisdiction. Eligibility restrictions apply. Valid only in states where DraftKings pick six operates. Pick six not available in all states, including but not limited to Connecticut and New York. For up-to-date list of states, please visit dkng.co slash pick six states. Void were prohibited. See terms and pick six dot DraftKings dot com. And thank you to our friends at DraftKings for sponsoring today's episode of the John Candy Show podcast. All right, guys, that's that. Let's get over to your questions here, shall we? Jonathan, what do you got first? Uh, Sanchez guy says, hey, John, welcome back. What are you planning to do on Valentine's Day? It's Madam Web. I, I, I don't know. Like, um, Ann and I have never, honestly, Ann and I have never made a big deal out of Valentine's Day. Never? No. Like, I mean, we'll, we'll go to dinner and stuff like that, but neither of us think Valentine's Day is a... I'm sorry. I guess my, my I, I turned my mic off for for the commercial break. Sorry, um, Ann and I have never really done much for Valentine's Day. Um, like I said, we'll go out to dinner once in a while, um, but to, neither of us is a is a big deal. Um, although, I think I've told this story once before many years ago. Let me tell you the story now. Should I close my ears? No, has nothing to do with Ann. Okay. <laughs> so Ann's butt. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Heart shaped. Oh my God, I almost like your base right in uh, nine and a yeah. half weeks. So, um, back when I still live in Canada, I actually I got engaged once to a girl I had dated for for a long time. She was she wonderful girl, wonderful girl. And one of the things about me and my dating, my girlfriend's parents always loved me more than the girl did. Like uh, the girl, I I was the <laughs> ultimate guy to bring home. I was my dad taught me to be respectful yeah. and all that kind of stuff, right? So parents loved me, except. This girl's mom. <laughs> and me and this woman who was going to be my mom. By the way, nice lady. We just couldn't click, right? Um, she was going to be my mother-in-law. So one day, she swings by my office as she was dropping some stuff off for, for my girlfriend. And she goes, oh, so like, what are you doing for Valentine's Day? And I said, well, actually, we're not going to do anything. I, you know, it's... Oh I don't really consider it much of a, of a real holiday, so oh. we're probably not going to do much. And then she started to go off on, well, you know, I think it's only appropriate that you at least buy flowers. You need to make plans for, <coughs> for the weekend, and you need to do this, and you need to do that. And I said, well, well you know, I'll, I'll definitely buy flowers. I mean, I'm 100% going to buy flowers. <laughs> well, yes, but, you know, what kind of commitment is that? You need to make plans for the weekend. You need to do this and you need to do that. And she's sitting there telling me. And I'm like, to me, it was like nails going across a chalkboard. And I finally said, as respectfully as I could, I said, so-and-so, I really appreciate the advice and stuff like that. But, and granted, in hindsight, this was not the best choice of words. I said, it's really none of your business, which she and I do for, oh, for Valentine's yeah. Day. Oh. Wrong thing to say. Stone Dude. Cold Steve Austin in the house. Yeah, because you heard the glass break. Oh, yeah. It was it. Because as soon as I said that, <laughs> this woman, my, my, my at the time, future mother-in-law at the time, 
Her face turns beet red. Uh huh. And she yells that everybody else in the back of the office could hear too. Yes, it is my business because she's my daughter and I love her and you're an asshole. Wow. For and blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. I can yeah. see it pause and then turn black and white and go, na, 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 na. <laughs> na, 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 na. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. It's like, oh, it went, <laughs> went totally OG. <laughs> Apparently the wrong thing for me to say. Oh, yeah. I could have worded that better. But no, as far as Ann and I go, neither of us think Valentine's Day is a big <laughs> thing. So we might have dinner. That'll be about it. All right, what's next? You could have just said okay. That's <laughs> should, it. Okay I should have just said okay and be done with it. <laughs> All right, what's next? Uh, we got Christopher Brickner who says, John, was Argyle so bad it literally made you sick? He was sick before. <laughs> he actually got better. No. Yeah, that's yeah, the, you know, be better today. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's because I took a few days off. Good, good, good. So what was happening was like last week, I, I missed a couple of shows. It wasn't because I got deathly sick. It's because my voice was just kept getting worse and worse. Yeah. And I finally said, you know, I, should, I better take a day off. So I did. Friday came, the voice was a little bit better. I thought, you know what, the weekend is right here. I'm going to take another day off, rest the voice more. And um, it's still not, you guys can tell, it's still not 100%. Yeah, but, but I got to the point where I was asking you every day, hey, do you think you need to go to the doctor? Because I was getting a little... Yeah, but it was just the voice. Like, I'm healthy. I feel good. But it's just the voice was completely bad. I still have to have halls on hand, uh, stuff like that. I know some people get drives them crazy when they say, John, why do you got candy in your mouth? Listen, motherfucker, I don't have candy in my mouth. I have halls in my mouth because it's <laughs> it's it's what makes me able to speak. The poor man's breath mint. <laughs> the poor man's <laughs> this is expensive stuff. <laughs> All right, what's next? Uh, Monkey Pants says, I believe Two and a Half Men should be in the conversation as one of the best sitcom TVs or has had to offer. Might not be the most popular opinion. It's mine. I respect that. Yeah, I didn't find show. the show funny. Uh, I want Now, granted, I've seen maybe six episodes in it total. So I don't have seven. a really good sample size. Right. <laughs> but um, I, I personally <clears throat> never found the show all that funny. But, I mean, it was a huge hit. Yeah. It was just, you know, it's it's kind of like Big Bang Theory. Another big, huge, monstrous hit that I I never found funny. It wasn't Three and a Half Men? Charlie Sheen. Charlie Sheen, yep. The guy who's the new Lex Luthor uh, was in that. And then and uh, half, dude man. from that 70s oh, show. John Cryer, yeah, Ducky, then. man. Yeah. Ducky John from Cryer. Pretty Pink. Yeah. Um, and then as far as Big Bang Theory, it's a show about nerds being written by people who have no understanding of nerd culture. Uh, so, but, but again, that's me. Obviously, lots of people love those shows. So mm -hmm. that's the beautiful thing about the art, man. Everything hits us all in different ways. All right. What's next? Uh, we got Raymond Verrata who says, sorry, uh, being late to the party, but according to Deadline, Donnie Yen is starring in a Kung Fu remake directed... Uh, by David Leach of Deadpool 2 and Fall Guy. Well, that's interesting. Wow. I mean, just say Donnie Yen's in something and I'll mm -hmm. I'll be interested, but David directing it? Sure. I mean, I, I haven't heard that myself. But Bring if that, it on. That's true. Bring it on. I'm, I'd be excited to see that. All right. What's next? Okay. Dwight Cinema says, good to see you again, John. Happy to know you're feeling better, a little better. I'm very excited to finally see Deadpool 3 trailer this Sunday. Fingers crossed. Uh, any further thoughts on it? Thanks. Bring on the filthy. It's, again, I don't mean to put added pressure on it. It's got to kill. It's got to kill. Um, the MCU, the MCU is not dead, but it's not in its, it's in its worst health I've ever seen it in. <laughs> and it needs a big win. It's got to be Deadpool 3. And you got to, this is your first impression. You only get one chance to make a first impression. Now, granted, remember, we're not going to see the whole trailer of the Super Bowl. We're going to see a 30-second version of it that'll then end with saying, trailer online now. But this trailer has got to kill. You, you got to show us a lot of Wolverine and a lot of Deadpool together. Give us a couple of the cameos in it to build up the hype and the excitement. Show some good action. And, uh, and you'll be good to go. It doesn't have to give us much of the story. It doesn't have to give us that. Just give us a sense of the film, and we'll be good. I know, Rob, what are you expecting from it? Exactly what you said. I mean, talk about having to kill. Talk about, you know, what Matthew Vaughn said, resuscitating the entire MCU. There is, if there's something, I heard something about this movie. And if it's true, it, 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 it could be a setup and a payoff. It could be one of the great payoffs in cinema history that they could actually set up in a trailer and people would go bananas, but they would go even more bananas when they see the trailer. But the would they go bananas? Because is, is the thing we're talking, is you and I both know what we're talking about. I don't think we're talking about this, maybe the same thing. Oh, we're not? No, I think, I think maybe not. 
Are we talking about the guy and the appearance of the guy? There, there is. This is this is the appearance of an a guy. A guy. Just yeah, a guy. Okay. Sure, a guy. I don't know if it's the guy. Oh, yeah. There's lots they? of guys that appear. I know, in this movie. but I think I, I think we're talking about the There's same lots one. of guys, anyway. but, but it's a two parter. It's a right. it's a two part thing to this appearance, and I I, I I they could do that and people would go bananas. But here's the thing, I don't think this movie needs to be sold on gimmicks or cameos. I think the key to making this movie work is 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 Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool and Hugh Jackman as Wolverine, and I think I hope that they hold off on the gimmicky nature of cameos because look what happened with Multiverse of Madness. Everybody's like, oh my God, we're going to get... And it was it was not a large part of that movie. And I'm really hoping what they lean into in terms of marketing this film is the two of these guys together because that to me is the big draw. And, and I think if they can give us a Hope and Crosby or a Lethal Weapon or take your pick, whatever your favorite Butch and Sundance... You know, whatever your favorite duo is in movies, that this duo together, these two guys, are the experience that we're going to want to see. I hope they don't show us any cameos, they don't spoil anything, and they give us Deadpool and Wolverine. Because if they're just like standing there looking at a camera for 20 seconds, and then one, one of them turns to the other and says something, and the other guy says something back, and it slays, and it just says Deadpool 3. That's probably That's what's all they happen. need. Okay, but I want to bring up, want to bring up a statistic. You're talking about, you know, they shouldn't have the cameos, and look what happened with Multiverse of Madness. Do you recall how much money the Multiverse of Madness I made know. on its opening weekend? Anyone to take a guess? Like in this era when comic book movies are not killing it opening weekend. Was it ninety million? 90 Hundred and eighty five million. Hundred and eighty seven million dollars yeah. on opening oh, weekend. Geez. You're damn right the people at Marvel are looking at, gee, that really worked for us with Dr. Strange <laughs> and the Multiverse of Madness. I know. And remember, remember, this is a football audience, right? It's a football audience. I don't know that just having, I mean, it'll work for you and me, but I don't know if just having Hugh Jackman and, and Ryan or Deadpool and Wolverine like, just kind of stand there and say one line. I, I think you go for some of the, the quick of clips. You go for some of the quick cameos. And I think it's going to sell the shit out of it. Okay, movie. I got a question for you. Knowing how they've marketed Deadpool 1 and 2. Right. Do you think this 30-second spot is actually going to be excerpts from a trailer? Mm -mm. Yes. Or is it going to be something they've mm -mm. actually shot specifically for the Super Bowl? That's what I think. And then it says, trailer coming soon. That's I, right. I think, and it won't be coming soon. It'll say online now. Online, okay. I, I think it will be a 30-second version of the trailer with the possibility of the first eight seconds being an introduction. See, I think it's going to be something spot. original that they've made specifically for yeah, the Super yeah, Bowl. They, I, I wouldn't put money against that. I don't think it's what they do, but I wouldn't bet against it. Okay, and if it is, what are the odds Taylor Swift is going to be in it? <laughs> There's a pretty good... I... Again, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. If Kansas wasn't in the Super Bowl, I would say no. But with Kansas yeah. being in the Super Bowl... And you know she's going to be there. Maybe. Maybe. She I mean, they could maybe. even do a live commercial with <laughs> no, Hugh Jackman on, and Ryan Reynolds together in costume by, somewhere in that stadium. By the way, let me let me get, let me rant on this for a second. I did. The, I, I talked about this. I think on an open mic, but the amount of man babies I have seen surrounding this Taylor Swift thing with her being at the football games really makes me worried about the future of masculinity. <laughs> it really does. Cause we don't have men out there anymore. We got these little suck babies out there now. Cause here's the thing they show uh, Taylor Swift. First of all, the, the uh, Kansas city, Baltimore Ravens game, the highest rated AFC championship game in the history of television <laughs> in the history of television. And if you don't know that has, that has a little bit something to do with the fact that Taylor Swift is there, then you're stupid. And I hear all these people, I've, I watch football to watch football. I didn't turn in the game to watch the camera go to Taylor Swift every five seconds. Guess what? CBS did a timer. Taylor Swift, in a three-hour broadcast, do you know how much time Taylor Swift was on screen seconds. for? How much? 25. 25 seconds. Yep. Exactly. She was on screen in the three-hour broadcast for 25 seconds. About as much as Cavill and Argyle. Now, 
Now, to that point, to that point, I was watching one of my favorite sports pundits. His name's Colin Cowherd on, on Fox Sports. And he brought up a great point. He said, guess what? Whenever I'm watching one of the Texas University games, every 30 seconds, they're cutting to Matthew McConaughey in the crowd. Yeah, it, I don't hear, I don't hear yeah. anybody complaining about that. When a New York Knicks game is on, and at least every 15 minutes, they got to do a quick shot of Spike Lee sitting courtside. I don't hear anybody crying about, I watch this to watch basketball, not Spike Lee on the ground. Back in the day, back in the day of Showtime, when Jack would be sitting courtside at the Lakers game, and they would at least five times a game cut the camera to Jack being courtside. Nobody cried and complained. Giselle. When Tom Brady was playing, Wait, when Tom be cut, cutting to Giselle, like, even Eli Manning, when Peyton Manning would be playing, yeah, they or their dad, it. or man, yeah, yeah, okay. like problem. that, right? It's like the fact that now, like, look, if it was like five minutes of Taylor Swift, I would get it. It was twenty-five seconds, and I just cannot believe the amount of man tears that flow over this. It's but, just, it's, it's John, critical. Do you know what's even weirder to me about this whole thing? When I was growing up, the idea of the head <laughs> cheerleader. The idea of the head cheerleader dating the captain of the football team was like the most all-American thing ever. So to have to have Taylor Swift, who just won another Grammy, yeah. Yeah. several, know, several, several Grammys, but but she's worth over a billion dollars, and Travis Kelsey, one of the greatest players in his position to ever play football, the two of them together is the ultimate example of American greatness, American power, American <laughs> aspiration. We as men should be looking to them going, you guys should be the new Mount Effin Rushmore. This is exactly what America is all about. And for anybody to cry over this, what the hell what kind of an American are you? This is the most amazing power couple in the world. Only in America do we have, this is this Trump's royalty, this Trump's the British, UK, whatever monarchy you want to look at. No, we have it. We have the biggest power couple in the history of power couples. Thank America. You. I should have been rolling and I'm proud to be an Ameri American. Uh, proud to be you. an American. I mean, I'd, honestly, I do not understand why they are not the most exalted two people. Because first of all, you look at the Kelsey bros. They're amazing They're American amazing. men. The Kelsey oh, brothers are like be the best. Them? And Taylor Swift. I mean, what what person in America does not look at this and go, that's the most aspirational thing, and it could only happen in the greatest country in the world? Now, somebody <laughs> wrote to me once, said there was, there was a game once where like Christian Bale was in the audience, and the camera said, they only cut to Christian Bale like twice. I'm like, okay, fair enough. And, and that's good, because he's just there as an as a audience member, right? But I would submit that it wasn't at a WNBA game, but... If that game that Christian Bale was at was a WNBA game and he was dating one of the players on the court, do you not think every time that girl made a basket, they wouldn't cut to Christian Bale cheering on his girl? Of course they would. Mm -hmm. Of course they would. Also, and they'd be stupid not to. Also, that Donnie Yen story dropped like an hour ago. Just it now. did? Yeah. Oh, we'll have to talk about that tomorrow. Fine, okay. I also want to point out, <laughs> I also want to point out that neither one of these people, obviously Taylor Swift also had the support of her parents. Uh, her her father, incredibly savvy businessman, but Taylor Swift was the first songwriter, I believe, to co-write all the songs on a Grammy-winning record. She does all of her own writing. I, I mean, mean, I mean, I mean, she's not an that amazing, has anything to do with. And the, what she the did Super as a Bowl. business person after the Scooter or us, the Scooter McNeary, the, the, the situation, yeah, the, that. What Sorry, she, Scoot McNeary's the Scooter, actor. No, not, I keep. Yeah, I want to say Scooter Libby. Or Scott. That's Scoot, different. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, you know, but but what she did is an amazing. There's nothing about Taylor Swift that does not represent the greatness of America, and I don't understand. And and by all accounts, she has her cadre of loyal girlfriends. What she does for her fans is amazing. Why would anyone have a problem with this? So let's get back to the Super Bowl for a second. So since. Kelsey is in the Super Bowl. <laughs> I think that triples the chances that maybe they they flash. By the way, no one's ever made it official that Taylor Swift's in this movie. We just no. all surmised that. Yeah, she yeah. may or she may not even be in the movie. Who knows? But maybe she plays herself. I don't know. I would like to see a Dazzler cameo, to be honest. I mean, and she should like have a like I said, big musical number in the middle of the thing. Why don't they go to a Dazzler concert? Why not? You could shoot it. You could use footage that they shoot. I didn't know. Right. We, we need to move on here. So I that just, super so, chat. I just love the yeah. super chat. So, Dwayne, yeah, we do think the Deadpool uh, trailer will be in, 
Don't yeah, and that uh, it's going to be a banger. Mm-hmm. All right, what's yeah, next? Answer your question quick. God bless him. All right, uh, Alpha. I'm just going to say Alpha. Uh, I don't think we see a Marvel DC crossover soon, but if we are it, but if it had ever happened, I think the show What If is a good place to do it. Come on, Gun and Feige. No, I think if you're going to do it, you do it. I think I think it would just be a stupid mess. Yeah, I don't see any purpose whatsoever. And by the way, I think What If is a stupid mess. Um, (laughs) But there. Anyway, I I don't really see any purpose (laughs) in doing a Batman. It has no meaning. It would have no repercussions in and of itself. It I I think it would just be a mess of a story. Plus, you try to have say I don't know Batman and Spider Man the same. By the way, they did it in the comic books. But it's, it's a different thing. It's one thing to hire an artist and an inker to make a comic book. It's another thing to put up however many millions of dollars to make this thing. And then you'd have two studios fighting over, no, Batman should have this line. No, Spider-Man should have this line. It would just be a nightmare. And I I don't see it ever happening. And I'm totally good with it. Just give me great DC movies. Give me great Marvel movies. It's all we need. All right. What's next? Uh, we got Nat Reed's thoughts on the PJ finale and series overall. I have no idea what PJ is. Pajamas. All right, what's next? <laughs> uh, D- uh, Dino Vader writes, Today I saw the trailer for Civil War for the first time. Cold shivers ran down my spine. John, I recommend you and Ann pack up and move to Canada in November. Yeah, I'll tell you what. When we were sitting in the theater for Argyle, by the way, not Avengers Civil War, but <laughs> right. the upcoming movie Civil War. The Alex Garland Offerman. Civil War. Yeah, with uh, Nick Offerman in it. Um, I mean, I the people sitting a few seats, few empty seats down from us we're like, this just feels too real right now. Mm. This just feels too real right now. I got to watch that. It's the sequel to Leave the World Behind. <laughs> yeah, in many ways. <laughs> uh, it would kind of be a spiritual sequel to it in a lot of ways. But it, I, okay, that aside, it looks really good. Yeah. It looks really good. So, it's the yeah. red dawn of the 2020s. Uh, and they were talking uh, about Percy Jackson. Oh, thought it was great. I love the series. I thought it was a wonderful, uh, wonderful, wonderful ending to it. All right, what's next? Uh, Zamaria writes, oh, you can call me Z. So, hey, guys, you can call me Z, by the way. My boyfriend and I saw Argyle at uh, AMC in Town Square. In I Las really like that theater in Las Vegas. That's a good one. Uh, not impressed. However, we are enjoying our first time in Vegas. Hope you get better, John. Have a fabulous time. I, I, I've been actually, you know what? That theater, the Town Center AMC, in the middle of the pandemic, when... Theaters had been closed for like four months or something like that. We, I, hadn't, I hadn't stepped into the longest I'd ever been in my life without stepping into a movie theater since I first started going to movies. Four or five months in, Nevada let movie theaters open. And X-Men... New uh, Mutants. New Mutants. Mm-hmm. X-Men New Mutants. Oh, sorry. They just called it New Mutants, not X-Men New Mutants. New Mutants was opening. And it was playing in Vegas. Me and Soul got in a car... Drove three and a half hours to Las Vegas to go in and watch a movie at a movie theater. Turned around and drove three and a half hours back at that specific movie theater. But uh, yeah, too, uh, enjoy Vegas. Ann and I love Vegas. We're going again in a couple of weeks. We got CinemaCon coming up too in, in August, in April. Um, I did sign up. Awesome. Uh, so I hope you have a great time and I hope you enjoy that theater because it's really good. Even if Argyle wasn't all that great. All right, what's next? Gostop says, hi, crew. A lot of talk recently about IPs falling into the public domain. Are there ways to stop that from happening? Uh, comments you made regarding Batman and public domain recently has me worried for it. Um, not really. I mean, the, the, the studios and the corporations will spend lots of money on, on legal departments to try to figure out ways to circumvent it. But public domain... And, and stuff like this lapsing is meant to entice and encourage ingenuity and advancement. And sometimes that takes something like patented works to lose their patent. Now, there's a difference between trademarks and patents. Like trademarks never lose, but Batman is not a trademark per se. Um, so no, now it's also important to remember, like the Mickey Mouse situation, Mickey Mouse is not in the public domain, all right? The specific Mickey Mouse that we saw in Steamboat Willie Mm -hmm. is in the public domain. The modern iteration of Mickey Mouse, with the big white gloves and the buttons and the pants and all that, that's not in the public domain. 
just the Mickey that you saw in Steamboat Willie and only that character is in the public domain. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens, Rob, because like, for instance, when Superman was first introduced, he didn't fly. Right. He was able to leave tall buildings in single yep. bound. And Lex Luthor was only mad at him because Lex, he, Lex believed Superman was responsible for making him bald. That was the original Lex Luthor's motivation. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see when Batman and Superman, which by the way, it's still a ways off. I think it's still like 10 years away. Yeah. When those go into the public domain, there is still a lot of our understanding of Superman and Batman that are not public domain. So uh, they'll just have to deal with it when the time comes. All right, what's next? Monkey Pants is back. Alexander the Great documentary series was good on Netflix. Glad oh, to hear that. I want. I've seen the. I saw it just flipping through Netflix, but I was curious because I, I'm that part of bit of a history buff yourself. <laughs> I'd be. I'd be interested in seeing that. That's. A, I didn't even know it was out. Yeah, I just, I just saw that. The thing is, it it kind of you know it looks like a very handsome Hollywood actor is playing him, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> no, Colin Farrell was good. Well, yeah, we were just talking off camera about. What was it called? Griselda? Yeah, Griselda. Yeah. Griselda, because she didn't look like actually so Sophia Vergara. Yeah, no, no. The real life Griselda did not look like Sophia Vergara. But that show's pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah, it looks really good. All right. What's next? Mike Thompson says, I admit I'm conflicted. On one hand, Rock versus Reigns is a match I've wanted for years. On the other hand, I want to point I want the point of Cody winning the Rumble. All right. You know what? Or what was the point of Cody winning I, the Rumble? Okay. So somebody brought this up to me and it's like, it makes perfect sense now. So they were trying to set up Cody versus Roman Reigns as the main event at WrestleMania. They've been, right? Yeah. They've been setting that up, which to me is stupid because wasn't that just the main event at WrestleMania? Like, isn't that, wasn't that the main event at WrestleMania we went to? It's uh, I, Rocky anyway. one, Rocky two. Right. That's so, what it is to me. So that that's fine. But for those of you who don't know, unlike back in the day, WrestleMania now is a two day event. They have their night one main event and they have their night two main event. Now, apparently, the night one main event was supposed to be um, um, da -da 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 -da. CM Punk. Well, yeah, CM Punk and Seth Rollins versus Seth Rollins, right? That was supposed to be night because you need to have two big main events. So it was going to be Seth Rollins versus CM Punk on night one. Mm hmm. Cody Rhodes versus Roman Reigns on night two. Well, a wrench got thrown into the works. <laughs> CM Punk got injured. Ugh. And he can't perform now. Rock versus Seth Rollins makes no sense. Like, you got the Rock. You got to put him in WrestleMania. Rock versus Seth Rollins makes no sense at all. Mm -hmm. Rock versus Roman Reigns, his own cousin, the former biggest guy in the company versus the current biggest guy in the company, and Seth Rollins versus Cody Rhodes makes a lot more sense than Rock versus Cody Rhodes. So look, I know a lot of people were looking forward to um, Roman Reigns versus Cody Rhodes. But seriously, if you're the programmer for WrestleMania, if you've got half a brain, you know you can't just have a can match, some tin cans fighting in the main event of night one. you got to have a big, big draw. Cody Rhodes versus Seth Rollins... That's a main event at WrestleMania. Rock versus his own cousin. And then guess what? Two months later at the next big WWE pay-per-view, you can have Cody Rhodes go and get the title then. No, it's, so it, it sucks. Been, yeah. It sucks that CM Punk got injured, but it kind of made it necessary. That It's just, I'm sorry, you can cry about all you want, but it's the one that makes sense. And they'll just give Cody Rhodes the belt in a couple of months. No big deal. All right, what's next? AL says, I watched Argyle over the weekend. Unfortunately, it wasn't very good. The first half was really funny, but the second half was a mess. To me, it wasn't even the first half. The first act, like the first 30, <laughs> 35 minutes, was actually pretty good. It was the movie that the trailer kind of told me it was going to be. But after that, it turns from Kingsman into Kingsman 2. And like all these logic leaps and all these, oh my God, these twists that they throw in there just ultimately made sense where at the end of it this one lady does a mind control thing on somebody i'm just like if she could have done that this whole time why didn't she just do that earlier in the film oh, i don't know i mean it was just oh it's bad so bad and if, again i'm not trying to talk you out if you liked it i'm not trying to talk you out of liking it at all if you liked it i love it i'm so happy you liked it 
I just, I really didn't though. <laughs> now I want you to see it, Rob, because I'd love to hear your. It just bums me out. I'd love you to know? hear your opinion of just it if you saw it, it though. though. You know. Yeah. All right. I'm, what's like next? I'm... Layer cake. Raziel Prime says, "Hi, crew. I'm so happy for Picard season three cast and crew, and I'm really excited to meet most of the cast in October to get them to sign my Picard season three steelbook and key art poster from Vice Press I got today." What event is going on in October? Uh, Probably a Star Trek con. Yeah. The one that happens in Vegas? Maybe. There's also one in San Francisco. I'm not sure. Because our friend Scott Mance often is a host at that. Yeah. Star Trek. By the way, our friend Scott Mance is now a Screen staff member over at Screen Rant. Yeah. Screen yeah. Rant. Good and for him. he hosted the pre-show at the Saturns yesterday. Oh, did he? I did yeah. not know that. He's always keeping us on the red busy. carpet. Scotty. All right. What's next? David Aaron says, rarely does my opinion differ so dramatically than the consensus, but I adored Argyle. Good. Everything I hoped from the trailer and more can see it becoming a cult hit down the line. <laughs> it won't. I guarantee you it won't. But I'm glad you liked it. And don't let the fact that somebody, by the way, somebody else, even me, disagreeing with you does not invalidate your experience with it. If you watched it and you liked it, that's awesome. Because all movies hit us in different ways. Certain things work for us, certain things don't, and it's unique to all of us. And if you watch it, if you paid your money to sit your ass down in a movie theater and you were entertained, it doesn't matter if I was or somebody else was or whatever. That's the important thing, and I'm glad you had a good time. All right, what's next? Okay. Uh, Noam says, enjoyed Argyle, but the writing, especially in the third act, was so weak. I get people who didn't like it, Sam Rockwell, and the action saved it for me. It's unfortunate that the badness of this movie is going to overshadow the fact that Sam Rockwell was really quite good. <laughs> and Sam, I, I like Sam Rockwell in this movie. I, I, I really did. And I mean, I, a lot of the writing was bad, but I never thought about seeing Sam Rockwell as an action star. I could see him as an action star. I totally could at this. Even at this point in his career, I could see him as an action star. All right, what's next? Uh, we got... Uh, Baba Yaga, who says, saw Argyle last night. If I had gone to the movie by myself, I think I would have walked out. I, it, re <laughs> it refused to stop pissing me off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it just it has a mind of its own. You know what? That, that's like, like I said, after the first 20, 30 minutes, it just started, it, it started disappointing me. Then it started boring me. Then it started pissing me off. And then it just kept finding new ways to piss me off. It was like, <laughs> Oh my God. And the post credit scene, the post credit scene is so bad. So bad. Anyway. All right. What's next? Okay. I mean, says, did you hear Nolan say that Dune 2 is Denny Villeneuve's Empire Strikes Back? Such high praise coming from him. So exciting. Someday. You know, it would probably be a mess and they probably shouldn't do it, but there are great tandem directors out there. You know, the, the Coen brothers, um, I, I love Neville Dean and Taylor as, as a directing duo. Uh, Lord and Miller. Man, can you imagine someday from Christopher Nolan and Denis Villeneuve come? I mean, they're two such powerful, singular vision guys. I, I, they probably couldn't possibly do it. But you know what? If those two try to pull a Steven Spielberg and Peter Jackson when they did Tintin, yeah. You know, and like one would produce, the other would direct, and then the sequel, the other would direct and the other would produce, you know, which the sequel never came. But I mean, if if Nolan and Denis Villeneuve ever teamed up to do something like that, like Nolan will produce the first one and Denis Villeneuve will, will direct the first one and then Denis will produce the second one and Nolan will direct. It would be awesome. You know what I would love to see? I Probably not the same level, but two evil eyes, Dario Argento and George Romero directing. <laughs> I would love to see both of those guys do a horror two horror films like balls Denis Villeneuve I mean he makes Sicario's got some really scary stuff in it Prisoners Enemy and Christopher Nolan says he's got like, scared of horror movies or whatever but our comedies but I'd love to see them both do a horror like two sides of whatever make it make it happen two evil eyes two all right what's <laughs> next uh monkey pads is back again how was meeting the cast of um SOA <laughs> oh yeah, sons, yeah. Of sons of anarchy yeah, this weekend, Anne and I went to Creep IE, where uh, I, now I've I've met a couple of the cast before. Like I've met Charlie Hunnam before. I've interviewed Ron Perlman a couple of times. Um, I met Alvarez. I forget the actor's name who plays Alvarez, but I met him briefly in, in Hollywood once. But I got to take my autographed Sons of Anarchy cut and go and get a picture with all those guys. 
and it was pretty awesome. And I just about geeked out because I went up to uh, like a couple of guys came over, said hi first, and I, Ron Perlman was last line. Went up, and Ron Perlman looked at me, and goes, I "Think you've interviewed me before?" And I'm like. Yeah, actually, yeah, I've interviewed you a couple of times. That was, that was the extent of our conversation that I had with Ron Perlman. But just the very fact that I think you've interviewed me before. It's like, that was like, ah! <laughs> I just about pissed my pants. I thought it was so cool. Okay, anyway, what's next? All right, uh, Carlos, uh, Eternals is the MCU movie I appreciate most upon rewatch. If someone asked Scorsese which MCU movie feels most like cinema, this would be it. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Look, I don't think Eternals is is a top five MCU film, but I I really enjoyed it. But, I do too. But you know, I I remember both you and I saying when we came out of that, we said, if you're looking for your traditional MCU movie, this isn't going to be it. It's a it was a very very different kind of movie than your traditional MCU movie. Uh, and I'm not saying everything everything about it was great and perfect and all that kind of stuff, but I thought it was better than a lot of people gave it credit. I know you really enjoyed it yourself. I did too. I mean, I I don't think it's a great MCU movie, but I think it's a really interesting science fiction film. Mm. And I really enjoy. Look, I always liked the the Kirby version of the characters. I like the Neil Gaiman version of the characters. I really like the version of the characters that are in the uh, AXE Judgment Day graphic novel or uh, omnibus because they're badasses but yeah I, I and i think that film has a humanity in it that is lacking from a lot of say superhero films and i know mm. a lot of people don't dig it but i i do enjoy it and let's just say i got two words for you Chippa chan <laughs> yeah all right what's next Hoopsuni <laughs> says i watched twin peaks for the first time and loved it but for some reason i'm finding it difficult to get through the 27 uh seven the 2017 sequel uh four or five episodes in what are your thoughts and would you recommend finishing it oh please do get to episode get to the all i can say is get to the nuclear bomb episode i understand why people say that like i'm a huge twin peaks fan twin peaks the return is the most david lynch of the twin peaks stuff and it, it is not for everybody but i would absolutely suggest finishing it because there's some amazing stuff to come all right what's next Derek Santiago says, hi, JC, longtime listener, first time chat, uh, saw Ava DuVernay's origin, most powerfully, totally overlooked by Oscars, in my opinion, deserved best adapted screenplay, Barbie. Oh, Here's the thing Barbie. about, though, I don't know when it was officially released, because if it was officially released after December 31st, then it doesn't qualify for the Oscar. And again, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not saying it did come out in the new year. I'm not saying it didn't. I'm just saying... Um, one of the things that could possibly be an explanation for that, because I've heard, I haven't seen it myself, but I've heard nothing but great things about it, um, is is if it came out after December 31st, then it does not qualify for the Oscars. So that could be an explanation. All right, what's next? Uh, and then we have support from Sean Sheridan, Gray Fox 40, Jeffrey Solomon. <clears throat> this is just a tip. Thanks, Andy, guys. Uh, Andy then says... I'm pretty disappointed that the Super Bowl of all things, at least for this year, has conspiracy theories now and really stupid ones at that. Well, stupid people, stupid conspiracy <clears throat> theories. Yeah. I mean, look, it's it's taken a lot. It's taken a lot of energy me to hold back a lot of things that I want to say, but I won't. Uh, I'll just say that you're right. It's uh, it's really they just come to come. They just tend to creep out from under the carpet every once in a while. <laughs> all right. What's next? All right. We got. Bobby Jackson, who says, if you introduce Blue Beetle in a Booster Gold movie, they could be searching for Ted Kord separately and brought together for that common goal. Here's the problem. Here's the question I have. Take out the 3% of the audience that are comic book aficionados, yeah. right? And have be, be left with the other 97% of the movie-going audience. Is anybody asking for a Booster Gold Blue Beetle movie? Now, remember, they just had a Blue Beetle movie and nobody went to go see it. Are there are there enough people out there crying out? What we really need is a Booster Gold movie. Hey, listen, you give me a Booster Gold Blue Beetle buddy cop movie, I'm there. Did, did the actor uh, uh, confirm that it was this phase, this first phase that he's going to be back? No, he said he no. he specifically said I don't know when. See, yeah, okay, I can tell you. So be there. yeah, so this can be any time. Later, oh, later, be, later, later. Could be later. In five years. Yeah. Could be in five months. I mean, we just we just don't know at this point. All right, what's next? We got. 
Uh, Carl Jr. Hey, John. So F4 casting this week. Fantastic Four. Maybe. Listen, I, I said, I think it was at the beginning of last week. I yeah. could be wrong. I said, I heard that the casting will be announced within the next two weeks. But I said, I don't know that I buy that. Like, I, I was very careful to say, I don't know that I buy that. Uh, just, I, just hearing that whisper. I, I, but as a fan, as a fan, I still personally think we are going to get the Fantastic Four cast announcement before Super Bowl. Again, just just as a fan, speculating, but I think we're going to get the cast announcement before Super Bowl. We had a lot of Marvel news today, too, so it might be getting the ball yeah, rolling. Yeah, it might be ramping it up. News. Also, I mean, they need to gin up some hype. And and look, there's nothing that's more uh, hypeful than than Deadpool three and putting Jackman and I mean this is something that even if this weren't an MCU movie and we're still the 20th Century Fox still existed, to have this happen would be equally exciting. So this is this is a genuinely exciting thing that I think that the MCU should absolutely do whatever they can to springboard off of, because the Fantastic Four film has been teased longer than the Blade movie. And we don't even know anything about it. And they're the first family of Marvel. Yep. Except that it's probably going to be Pedro Pascal as Reed Richards, which I am all for. Yeah. I mean, that, all for. I, you know, I just would, we don't know. Are they going to do some cool retro 60s period piece? Is it going to be modern? Is there going to be Dr. Doom? Are they going to have Galactus? Who knows? I just want it to be good. All right. What's next? On to our members. Dominic Suma says, is Chris Pratt a big box office draw or has he just happened to pick great roles? Bit of both? I'd, I'd say it's a bit of both. I mean, first of all, I adore Chris Pine. I, I Chris uh, Chris Pratt, I mean. I also adore Chris Pratt, P Chris Pine. Yeah, me Chris too. Pine um, I, I've told you the story before, but like the first time I ever met Pratt, like he came to our office and like literally hung out there. Were you there that day, Ray? No, no, no. Okay. Make it. But he came with Vince Vaughn and they literally came to our office and hung out for like four, five, six hours. That we did interviews with them for a while. Then they hung out there to do some Twitter Q and A's. Just hang and we just hung out there. And, and they were Chris Pratt is seriously. He no, he's it. Chris Pratt is the single nicest guy I've ever met in the business. And so we did that. Then months later, months later. I go to the press junket. Oh, of course, that, sorry. Then a little bit later, he came in for Guardians of the Galaxy. You guys, some of you who have followed me long enough, you remember when Kevin Feige, mm -hmm. James Gunn, and Chris Pratt came into the studio to do, we did the special live broadcast just doing a whole Guardians of the Galaxy special. It was great having those guys in the studio. Six months later, when the actual movie was finally coming out, I go to do the press chunk, and this is back when I still did those stupid things. But I, it was my turn to go in and interview Chris Pratt. I've met him twice at that point, and it had been six months. But I go in to the room, and he's there. He looks up and goes, John. I go, hey, Chris, how you doing? He goes, hey, man, how's Anne? He remembered my wife's name, right? And I'm just like, she's great thanks and we just talked for a few minutes did the interview all that kind of stuff and then go i instantly take out my phone i text ann i go seriously i just walked in the room with him first thing chris pratt said is how's ann and she just texted back all these huge giant smile faces on her yeah i just well for his question is like for me for me like jurassic the jurassic world movies he's the reason why i went to go see those movies also dinosaurs but he, he got me in the theater seats but when I asked myself what I went to go to the theater to watch Tomorrow War, which I liked, that was on Amazon. Right, I too. I'm not sure if I would have went to the theater for that. So I, it's a hard question for me to answer if he's a box office draw or not. Because, you know, just for the reasons that I just stated. And like, like again, there then there, there was a, a, a bit of time there. You remember like in last year or so where it was like the cool thing online to hate on Chris Pratt? Oh, I don't... And like, okay, all I'll say is that ain't none of you met him because I, I've... And I've met him a number of times that he is legitimately 100% the sweetest, nicest, most considerate, like, dude I've met in this business, period. And stop. I've never met anybody nicer in this business. He's just like one of the sweetest guys. Really, really like him a lot. All right. What's next? 
Amin says, when talking about potentially reprising his role as Isaac in The Last of Us Season 2, um, Jeffrey Wright said anything is possible since we already no saw them do this in Season 1, bring back actors who played the actors and the uh, characters in the game. Do you think they will bring him back for the show? Mm, I don't know. Maybe. I mean, it's possible. He's, I mean, he'd be great to have in there, but... He's also now an Oscar nominee. Yeah, raises the budget. And I, I don't know how much he, he would legitimately and understandably be asking for to do it. So uh, one thing about that, though, you remember um, uh, Ron Swanson, Nick Offerman, was saying that there's been some talk about maybe doing a prequel series. Uh, the Craig Mazin came out and said, no, we're not doing any prequel series. So just a little update on that. Craig Mazin came out himself and said, no, we're not looking to go backwards on that. So there's that. All right, what's next? We got Evan, who says, hey, John, I hope you're feeling better. I saw Argyle last night. I was pretty disappointed, but Sam Rockwell is consistently the best part of the movie. Yeah, yeah Rockwell was was pretty good uh, in it. I, I, I liked him in it. Uh, I always like Brian Cranston. I mean, what's not to love about Brian Cranston? What a great cast, He's man. so The cast is so good. And the mom from uh, Home Alone. Oh, yeah. O'Hara. Uh, yeah, Catherine, Catherine O'Hara. Yeah. From Schitt's isn't Creek it? and Beetlejuice. I, and 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 be most importantly, too. Uh, from Schitt's Creek, yeah, uh, she was the whole cast is great. Um, even Dua Lipa, who is not an actress, but just the the the, the parts she had. I mean, she had to be sexy. She pulled off sexy, man. I mean, so much you had going for you in this movie to be so bad. It was just and such a great director, <clears throat> such a great director. Oh well, all right. What's next? Dr. Stinky says, hey, John and crew, I watched the short. If anything happens, I love you on Netflix about parents who lost their 10 year old daughter to a high school or to a school shooting. And it's so sad, but I recommend bring on the filthy. So it's a short, huh? Not like a I, I didn't know Netflix even had. Shorts. I didn't either. Uh, yeah. What's it called again? Uh, if anything happens, I yeah, love you. Oh, my God. Powerful words. All right. <laughs> Thanks for the recommendation, man. Appreciate that. What's next? All right. We got. Um, Jorge, uh, I, I, hi, John and crew. Can we get your thoughts on the Percy Jackson Olympian final or season finale? Thank you and, and hope you feel better. I thought it was quite good. But the one thing I will say, though, a, a little anticlimactic, um, a, a little bit anticlimactic. But even with that said, I thought that entire series, which, hey, full, I, I'm going to call myself out a minute. I thought making the series was maybe a mistake. But it was... And I say this as somebody who liked the first Percy Jackson movie. The series is better. The series is better. The cast is wonderful. I'd forgotten the final, like, I'm behind now on that and True Detective. But I agree with you. I think the show has been really good. Yeah. I've really enjoyed it. And having, um, uh, oh, why, why am I forgetting? Lance Reddick? From from uh, the John Wick movies? Is that, is that the actor's name? Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. Seeing him pop up in the series like at first i was just like oh because like it's i mean he passed away a while ago and, and you his I, I, voice too oh he plays zeus oh he does yeah he plays oh, zeus man. and it was just it was really really powerful seeing him on screen i i, I thought it was quite good i thought it was i enjoyed the series quite a bit all right what's next okay we got reviewed by nick who says hey gang i know this won't be a main topic but congrats to john williams for winning a grammy for instrument my instrumental composition for Helena's theme from Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Still winning in them Grammys. He's still collecting all them trophies. He just got another Oscar nomination. I think that's 735 now he has. They should give him an infinity gauntlet. At this point, they should just... You know what? 25 years from now, when John Williams passes away, and he's probably going to continue composing for the next 25 years, they should just rename the best score category to the John Williams Memorial Oscar category or something like that. I mean, they gave the recording studio on the Sony lot to that. They Did renamed they? it John, the John Williams recording studio. Cause that's where he worked. He was there with JJ Abrams, Spielberg and um, John Williams. And they dedicated it to him. Because I thought he, he did all of his, uh, at least most of his stuff at uh, Skywalker sound. He recorded, he records at Sony at oh, least really? with most like 17 of the 27 movies Spielberg did with him was recorded there. All right. Last question of the day. All right. What's next? Black Adder says, Hi, John and crew with Joaqu Joaquin Phoenix reprising his role of Joker. Can he be potentially nominated for Oscar for the same role twice? I know what happened with Godfather, but they were two different people. Um, Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you can. There, there's no rule that says you can't be 
uh, nominated for playing the same character. As long as it's in two different movies, you absolutely could. Now, before we go start etching his name into another Oscar, we haven't seen the movie. We've seen many sequels where actors who were killer in the first movie kind of mailed it in in the second one. We won't name names, but we can all think about 10 or 20 examples of that, right? I'm not saying Joaquin Phoenix will. I'm just saying, let's not get ahead of ourselves. But yes, theoretically speaking, if the performance is good enough, he 100% would qualify to be nominated in the category again. All right. And that'll do it for today's installment of the John Campia Show podcast. Thank you so much for being here, making this show part of your day. Big special thank you to all you guys who sent in those questions. Number one, because you gave us great fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported this channel as you did it and all of us involved with the show. Thank you guys so very much for your support. A little bit later this afternoon, guys, just a little live update. We're going to be doing an open mic in a few hours. So if you want to just come back and hang out and casually talk about more movie stuff, that's what we'll be doing a little bit later this afternoon. So... For all the people in the room with me, Ray Ora. It's January, baby. <laughs> Jonathan Voiko. It's March. Writer, director, producer, Robert Meyer Burnett. Swift Kelsey, America. <laughs> America. <laughs> my name's John Campia. Thanks a lot for being here, guys. And until next time, my friends, bye-bye.